Welcome back to the Astro Park, everyone. My name is Kwesi Akwa, and in this video, I'll be doing another tutorial session demonstrating my new editing workflow in PixInsight for deep space objects. I know a lot of you were requesting this video in the comment section for my imaging session video on the Jellyfish Nebula, so I'll be answering your requests. I first want to give a big shout out to Sean and Nick. So a Mr. Sean Nielsen who has his channel called Visible Dark where he has various PixInsight tutorials that are very informative. And also Mr. Nick who has his channel called Astro Exploring and he also offers some excellent PixInsight tutorials as well. And I borrowed the ideas from both of these gentlemen and put them together to create my own original workflow. So Sean and Nick, if you're watching this, thank you for all the tips that you've personally given me. So with all that being said, let's hop onto the computer, turn on PixInsight, and I'll demonstrate my new editing workflow that I did to process my new image of the Jellyfish Nebula. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm inside of PixInsight and I've pulled up my files that I took for the Jellyfish Nebula. So I have the Hydrogen Alpha data and the Oxygen 3 data. So we just do a quick auto stretch. We can take a look at what's going on here. So there's the H alpha and here is the O3. So I'll be creating a HOO bicolor narrowband image. And if you're interested in how I was able to process these two files, I extracted both of these in Astro Pixel Processor where I separated the color camera data into the HA and O3 wavelengths. So if you'd like to learn more about how I did that, you can watch my video called How to Process a HOO Narrowband Image from Color Camera Data. And the first part talks about how I generated this in APP. So let me turn off the auto stretch. Okay, so I add these two files, and the first thing we're going to do is use pixel math to combine both wavelengths into the HOO RGB uh, color frame. So I have a tab right here for pixel math, but you can also go to process, all processes, and find pixel math. So that should be right here. But I'm going to use my pre-made tab for this one. And you want to uncheck, use a single RGB expression, go to the editor, and then I'm going to put the two files in the correct uh, channels. So the red channel is going to have HA, green channel O3, and blue channel O3. So straight up HOO. So I click OK. And then the destination, drag this up a little bit. So we're going to create a new image. So click that there. And the color space will be RGB color. And then when I hit the square apply button, it will create the HOO image. And it's right here. So you can close out pixel math. Going to minimize the original files. Just pop them up in the corner to where I can see them. All right, so we have our HOO image. So we do an auto stretch on this. Looks a little, a little janky because I did different uh, refocusing sessions. So the alignments are a little bit misaligned. So what we're going to do is do a dynamic crop. So I'm just trying to figure out where all the images intersect 
and you can see these thick lines right here. So I think I'm going to crop it maybe around this section here. So next part is we do a dynamic crop. So I have the tab here, but you can also find it in processes, geometry, and dynamic crop. So we can just click that for now. So for a dynamic crop, I'm going to find this line. I think it's right about here. I can kind of see it because of the green overcast. And then stop it right about there. So basically, I'm going for where everything intersects, more or less. A little too far. Bring this up a bit. And... Just a smidge there. I think that's good. So once you get the square set up, you can just hit this green check mark and it'll do the crop. And there we have it. So our dynamic crop is finished. So next step I'm going to do is a DBE or a dynamic background extraction. So I'll create this. Uh, pre-made tab that I have. So these are the parameters that I use from Sean Nielsen's tutorial on how to do DBE. So I'm going to be using a tolerance of 2, a shadow relaxation of 6, and a smoothing factor of 0 0.25. Then I click on sample generation. I'm going to make the Sample box, well, 120 is pretty good because the bigger the sample box is, the more background we're able to sample. So I'm going to regenerate this. And then I'm only going to delete all the points with the exception of the perimeter on the outside. So you don't want to have any sample points on the nebula itself. So I'm going to quickly delete these inward sample points. Yeah, it might be a little bit hard to see with green on green, but from my point of view, I'm fortunately able to see the points here, so I can just take these out. few more left. And you also want to avoid having these sample points on very bright stars as well, if you can avoid it. Okay, and that should do it. Okay, so I have the sample points on the edge of the photo. So we go to target image correction. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is do a division. So a division will remove any vignetting in the photo. So I have division selected, and I'm also going to discard the background model. You can keep this unchecked if you'd like to see it, but it just basically shows you a sample of the background that's being extracted, that gradient of the vignetting that we're removing but we don't necessarily need to see it, so I'm going to keep that checked. And I'm also going to replace the target image. Now, before I hit this green check mark, I'm going to take this triangle, drag it out to the side, and make a copy of this, because I'm going to do an additional step afterwards. So once we hit the green check mark, it'll do the division. And you get this result, which is perfectly normal, because I'm just going to reset the screen transfer function. So let me reset it here. And there we go. So now I'm going to reopen this process. So it basically saves everything that we did initially. But now, instead of a division, I'm then going to do a subtraction and this will remove any of the light pollution gradients that are still left over and then once I do that hit the green check mark again 
and it will do the division. And there you have it. So we've completed the dynamic background extraction. So we can then close out of this. And I noticed here, if I zoom in a little bit, I think there's like a black edge right there. So I might need to do another quick dynamic crop. So let me take care of that real quick. So geometry, dynamic crop. So I'm just gonna omit that black line on the outside. And then everything else should be normal. I actually had to move this corner up just a little bit. Yeah, so it'll highlight the uh, corners there. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. So bring it to the top. So I'm only interested in that black line on the side there. So let me take care of that. Execute. And there we go. So cleaned that up pretty nicely. Okay, so the next step is to do uh, color calibration. So you can do this by using the original color calibration. I have a tab here, and you can also go to process, all processes, and go to color calibration. But what I'm going to use is the auto color script. And this is a script that's not native to Pixinsight by default. You're going to have to download it separately. So if you do a search for Pixinsight auto color script, you should be able to find that in the internet search. But I'll also provide a link to the script in the description box down below. So when you successfully install the script, you can just go to scripts, go to utilities, and it's called auto color. So if we click on that, it'll then go through the auto color sequence. So it'll do the auto color calibration, and it will also do a auto background neutralization, as well as an auto white balance as well. So three you know, different techniques for the price of one, which is pretty neat. And depending on the speed of your computer, it should take about less than a minute or so. So I just finished the red channel, and it's getting ready to work on the green and blue channels. Okay, so green is finished. And then it's going to start the blue. Yeah, just about momentarily soon. There we go. There's the blue. So now you see how I did the auto background neutralization the auto color calibration and now I did the white color balance so all of that in one script so we can tuck that away and then the next thing I'm going to do is a selective color noise reduction or SCNR so you can go to process all processes and it should be a SCNR but I have a tab here so I'm going to use this because since I shot this with a color camera, with that RGGB matrix, I'm recording twice the amount of green light as opposed to red and blue. So it has a slightly green overcast. So I'm going to remove most of that. You usually don't want to remove all of the green because it might cause a little bit of gradients in the photo. So I just tend to remove around 80% of it. So I already have it set to 0 0.8. And then I'll drag this triangle onto the image. And we've removed the green cast. So we can close out of that. All right, so next step is to do the 
actual stretch. So let me deactivate the auto stretch, turn that off. And we'll do the stretch by doing a, a histogram transformation. So you can go to process all processes and histogram transformation. But I have a pre-made tab over here. So move this to the side real quick. So you want to make sure that RGBK is selected. Now you like to do a reset and then track it. And then I'll bring up the preview window on the side here. So basically to do a stretch, we'll use the uh, screen transfer function. So if you go to process all processes string screen transfer function. Bring that down here. So basically what we're going to do is grab the triangle here and then put it on the bar for the histogram transformation. And you'll see that there's an hourglass symbol next to my cursor. So that's what we're looking for. So I just drag it on there. In the preview, it will apply the stretch. And then all I gotta do is on the histogram transformation, drag that triangle onto our image. And now the stretch has been applied. So this white screen, you don't have to worry about because this is applying the uh, transfer function one more time. So you can just close out of that. And you can see how the red, green, and blue channels are pretty aligned for the most part, which is good. So our image has now been officially stretched. So we can close out of the histogram transformation as well as the screen transfer function. So this next part of the tutorial is the big game changer for me, as I learned this from Nick from Astro Exploring. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to remove the stars temporarily from the image. So we have just the background and the nebula. Then we'll do all of the edits on the nebula in terms of curves, transformation, saturation, and contrast details. And then we'll add the stars back into the photo once we're finished. So there's several techniques that you could use. I think some, one of the popular ones is known as Star Exterminator, but I'm going to be using uh, StarNet. Uh, more specifically, the latest version called StarNet 2, which is a separate download. And the original StarNet, or if you have StarNet++, that should also work as well. But I'll be using the StarNet 2 function. So if you go to Process, All Processes, so I have StarNet, I'm also going to use StarNet 2. So I have a pre-made tab here that I'm going to use. So the stride by default is 128. So I think you can also use 256, but by default I've been using 128 and that's been working pretty well for me so far. So I'm just gonna st stick with that for now. You also want to check create a star mask because we're going to remove the stars and create a mask from that. So once we do that, just take this triangle, drag it onto the image and StarNet will then work its magic. So depending on the amount of stars in the image, this can be really fast process or a very slow process. So this is gonna take several minutes for me. So I'm going to pause the video here and come back once the process is finished. Okay, so the StarNet 2 process has successfully completed. And as you can see, it did a great job at pulling out all the stars from the photo. So we have the star mask here, and then we have our starless image of the nebula here. So this is what we're going to be doing all of our work on. So I'm going to close StarNet 2, and I'm going to bring up the curves transformation. So you can do that by going to processes, all processes, and find Curves Transformation, but I have a pre-made tab here, so I'm going to pull that up, move this to the side a little bit. 
So first thing we're going to do is apply a curve to boost the contrast a little bit. So we'll bring up the real-time preview. And basically what we're going for is we're going to make a nice gentle uh, S curve to boost the contrast a little bit. So I'll do that by moving this point up a little bit. And it's pretty subjective, so it's up to the photographer's taste. So I bring this up a little bit, and I'm going to bring this point down. So I'm just slowly bringing it down just to get that contrast boost. Because what you don't want to do is go too far like that, because where you're clipping the blacks. And if you feel like you made a mistake, you can just click this button here for a reset in the bottom right corner and just try it again until you get it to where you want it to be. So bring that up and bring this down. I think it's a little too dark for my taste. Let me bring it up a smidge. Uh, maybe down a little bit. I think that's pretty good. I'll go with that. So when you get the nice curve that you're looking for, then grab a triangle and drop it on the image. Cool. So now we've applied the S curve. And this preview is showing if I were to apply the same curve again to the image, this is what it would look like. So as you can see, it's a little bit too dark. So let me reset it here. And I might, let me see if I can maybe do a small contrast and see how that looks. So just slightly up and maybe slightly down here. I don't want to make it too dark dark. Um, I think that looks, I'm going to reset it one more time. Try it again. So bring this up ever so slightly. And I'll bring this down. I think right about there looks okay. So I'm going to apply this one more time. Okay, so I think that's pretty good for my taste. So I'm going to do a reset here. And the next thing we can do is add some color saturation. Uh, you can also do color saturation through process, all processes, and find color saturation right here. But I also learned that you can do it within the curves transformation as well. So if you find this button here where it says S, as for saturation, you can click on that. And you can apply a color saturation boost this way as well. So if you're doing it this way, I usually like to grab it right in the middle and just bring it up just to see how it would react. Because if you do it too aggressively, it's too much saturation, right? So let me do a reset. I might have to apply this in levels. So I might do a small boost here. And see how that goes. So let's take a look at the real-time preview. That might help us out a little bit. So let me reset it here. I bring it up. So, yeah, so you see that's like super red and that's not what we're looking for. So I'm going to do this in stages. I might start here. Yeah, it actually looks pretty nice. So let me drag that on here. Okay, so if I were to apply this particular stretch again, it would look like this. And 
I actually, let me reset it. I'm going to bring it up ever so slightly. Like that. And then do another boost there. Okay, so I'm going to reset this. And also, for your preference, you can also manipulate the individual channels as well, as opposed to doing all three of them together. So if I wanted to work more on this hydrogen alpha, I can go to the red channel and then see how that affects it. Obviously, that's way too much red. But you can play around with it to your taste just to see if you want to get the desired result. And I think that, hmm, I think I'll bring the red up ever so slightly. Let me reset it. Just give it a little, a little bit of a red boost, like this. Just very, very subtle. And I'm going to apply that. Okay, so I think I'm done here. And looks pretty good. So the background's still nice and black. I brought the reds up ever so slightly. And everything else looks pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close out of the curves transformation. And then before we add the stars, um, we're going to do some noise reduction. So the old way I used to do this was with the multi-scale linear transform function. So if you go to process all processes, you can go to multi-scale linear transform. So it's right here. But the new way I do noise reduction is through the easy processing suite. And that's also a separate download through PixInsight. So if you look up PixInsight Easy Processing Suite in the search, you should be able to find that and download it to your system. And when you download it, it'll be available in scripts. Go to Easy Processing Suite, and we're gonna do Easy Denoise. So it's going to do the denoise process on this image. I don't mess with any of these settings. These are all the default. So once it's all set up, you can just simply click Run Easy Denoise, and it will go through the process. And this is a rather processor-intensive script. So it's going to do the denoise on different layers of the image and then give us a nice, smooth result at the end. So. For me, this will take several minutes. So once again, I'll pause the video here and come back when the process is completed. Okay, everybody, I'm back now and the easy denoise has now been completed. So we now have a very nice, smooth image of the Jellyfish Nebula. So I'm going to minimize these masks that the process used and bring these into the forefront. Okay, so now the next step, now that we've finished doing the denoise, we've done our curves transformation, next thing we gotta do is add the stars back into the photo. And then we can do that again by using pixel math. So, going to go back to the expression editor and then just edit this. So, we're going to use the star mask and then add back to our image. So that's image 03. And click OK. And then once again, we're going to create a new image in color space RGB color. So we just simply apply that. We get stars back into the image. Now I'm going to leave these in the background, just in case I have to do something again. But for now, we're going to be working with this new image. Okay, so 
One of the things about nebula photography is the star field. So if the nebula is in a giant field of stars, sometimes the stars can be a bit overpowering for the image so that the nebula doesn't stand out as much. So one of the new methods that I learned from Nick was doing a star reduction. And we do that by using the morphological transformation process. So we go to process, all processes, and you can click on morphological transformation. But I'll go ahead and bring up my tab here. So you can adjust it by the different amounts. So I currently have it at about 80% because sometimes, depending on the image, a smaller uh, reduction in stars might make the photo look a little weird, but it's up to the uh, photographer on how you want to do this. So one of the things that I learned by using this process is the structuring element. So by default, it's size three, which works perfectly fine. But I've also experimented with uh, size five. And then you can fill in these blanks to kind of make it as circular as possible because you want this to kind of represent a star of sorts, right? So it's circular in that nature. But for this, I'll use the default at size three. I'm gonna reduce it by 80% and just drag and drop. And as you see, the stars got reduced and the nebula pops out at you a little bit better. So I can just zoom in here and the stars look pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep this. So I'll close that. And then the last step I'm going to do is completely optional, but I'm, I'm going to add some sharpening to the nebula. Now, usually depending on what I'm photographing, I don't really do sharpening very much because I've noticed that making things a little bit too sharp makes it look a bit unnatural in my opinion, but sometimes sharpening can add a little bit of flair to the object depending on which object you're photographing. So it's completely optional if you want to do this. And the old process I used to use was once again doing the multi-scale linear transform where you basically select the different levels on where you want to do sharpening. But the new way I learned how to do sharpening is going through a process called the unsharp mask. So you can click that there. And I also have a tab here. Now, usually the standard deviation by default is two and you can change the amount here. So I usually start with maybe 40 or 50%. I'll start with 50 just to see how that looks. And you can add as as much or as little sharpening as you'd like. So I'm gonna start with 50%. And that actually looks pretty good. So let me look around a little bit. Yeah, it looks quite nice, I would say. So I think I'm just gonna leave it there. And then you can save this off as a TIFF file, bring it into Photoshop to do some additional edits if you'd like. But for here, I would call this a final process image of the Jellyfish Nebula.
So that was my new PixInsight editing workflow that I use for deep space objects. It's been working really well for me so far, and I'll most likely add more techniques to it later on as I gain more experience using PixInsight. If you have any additional questions, feel free to sound off in the comment section down below, and I'll try my best to help you out. As always, thank you for watching Astro Park, and until next time, take care, and I wish you all clear skies.